It's sort of like trading, when you give somebody something and they give you something. And when you earn it, you're either going to save it or spend it. And the best thing to do is spend it, because, I mean, save it. <laughs> you need money, like, to keep your family going and to pay your bills and to buy the supplies that you need for yourself and all kinds of things. <laughs> I ask you guys a question. If you saw Penny lying in the street, what would you do? Me? I always pick them up. Now, they may not look like much, but pennies really do have a way of adding up. In fact, this penny right here is one of nine billion produced in the past year. Now, let's say you decide to take all those pennies and line them up side by side. Did you know you would have enough pennies to circle the Earth, not once, not twice, but four times? I bet if you had your eye on a brand new pair of sneakers or the latest video cartridge, or even a brand new bike, then money would really be important. Mm. Yeah, but that's another story. Money is more than the things you can buy with it. Money is something that connects us all. And although you and I can't live without money, believe it or not, there was a time before there was any money. Imagine what a time like that must have been like. Long ago, before malls, music videos, or money, people traded for things they needed. So, while Ozzy offered a cow for Connie's chickens, Sue swapped salt for Pete's pots. This approach, called the barter system, had its drawbacks. Suppose something is worth half a cow. How do you make change? People soon realized that using one common item would make trading easier. In different places, people tried different things, including tea, seashells, fish hooks, furs, and weapons. In some places, people started using rare metals. The ancient Egyptians shaped gold into rings. The Chinese used cubes of gold. The first coins were made in Western Turkey. They were small, bean-shaped pellets. Gold and silver coins were ideal. They were widely accepted, easy to carry, and long-lasting. And you could make change and save your wealth. Of course, there were still a few drawbacks. I'm sorry. Your call cannot be completed as dialed because the telephone has not been invented yet. Please hang up and try again in 2,600 years. You know, in colonial times, people traded foreign coins of gold and silver, just like this one. This Spanish milled dollar is over 200 years old. So you see, the history of today's money began with coins just like this. The pine tree shilling was the first coin made in the American colonies and minting it was a crime. The British banned the manufacturer of the money in the colonies, but the Massachusetts Mint made the shillings anyway. Don't be fooled by that 1652 date. They used that date year after year so the British wouldn't know they were still in business. The situation finally changed during the American Revolution. Continental currency was printed to pay for that war, but the new government printed too much of it and the bills were soon worthless. With independence came the right to produce money. To handle this important job, the U.S. Mint was established in 1792. 
The mint began with copper pennies and moved on to gold and silver coins. The notes included beautiful illustrations by engravers. Just like today, these detailed pictures made the bills much tougher to counterfeit. The federal government got into the paper money business during the Civil War. And since the backs of the bills were printed in green ink, they were called greenbacks. You know, our money system has changed a lot since the Civil War, but the dollar bill is still green on the back. So before you spend your next one, take a close look at it. A real close look. This pyramid is a symbol of our lasting strength. It's unfinished because our country is still growing. Then there's the floating eye in the sky. The eye represents God watching over our country. Every bill says, in God we trust. Now, over here, an eagle holds arrows of war in one claw and an olive branch of peace in the other. The 13 leaves, arrows, and stars stand for the 13 original American colonies. You know, some people find money so interesting that instead of just spending it, they also collect it. And they don't have to be millionaires to do it. So let's meet some young collectors right now. This is Vanishree, Andy, Tom, and Rachel. Hi, how are you guys? Fine. Great. Good. Let's come over here to Vanishree. Tell me about your bill collection here. Well, this is a silver certificate, and this was made a long time ago, but now they've stopped making it, and they've made, and over here it says silver certificate. Now they make it a Federal Reserve note. Mm -hmm. And what about this one back here, I've noticed? It's a $2 bill, and they, it was made in 1976, and the president is Jefferson. Mm -hmm. But there aren't a lot of those. Uh -uh. That's pretty nice. Thanks. Now, Andy, tell me about your coin collection. Give me a tour. Okay. Those pennies are basically wheatbacks and Indian heads. Now, why is this Indian head penny separated from all the rest? What well, makes that special? It's my best Indian head. And what makes that so special for you? I got that on my birthday. Oh, great. Thanks a lot, Andy. Let's move on to Tom. Tom, tell me about your collection here. Well, I collect mostly American coins mm -hmm. that are silver, or at least part silver. OK, I notice you have a penny, a dime, nickel, half dollar, dollar. Why are all these coins separated from the rest of these? What makes them special? They're proofs. That means they have special finishes, and they're really shiny. Mm -hmm. And they're real valuable, so you don't want to take them out of this case. You want to keep them in there. And keep them clean. Mm -hmm. OK. Thanks, Tom. Welcome. Hi, Rachel. Hi. Now, I noticed something very, very special about your coins, especially your pennies. They don't look like they're all there. No. Tell me about that. OK, well, this is a regular Lincoln cent. And as you can see, these are error coins, which means that only part of it was struck. And then here, a lot of it was, wasn't struck. And here, none of it was struck. Mm -hmm. Now, I also see something in drink, because I see these pennies are also not struck properly. But right. what about this penny up there? This is a steel cent, and it was made during wo World War II because they were using all the copper to make the bullets. And they decided that they didn't want to waste it on pennies. And they made these kind of pennies for a year, but then they stopped. That really is interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you guys. It's a really great collection here. So, there you have it. We started out swapping cows for chickens and ended up with this. A way of moving billions of dollars through our country. So simple that it fits in the palm of your hand. Welcome to the largest coin factory in the world. You know, there are U.S. government mints in Denver, Colorado, San Francisco, California, and West Point, New York. But this one right here in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, is the largest. They make over 30 million coins a day. Besides the regular coins we spend every day, the mint also makes these special commemoratives, medals, and gold and silver coins which anybody can buy. Imagine having a coin collection like this. And now, 
a demonstration. This coin press is over 120 years old, and it still works. So I'm going to press my own commemorative medal. Behold, an ordinary blank piece of metal. Three, two, one. Wow. Now, this medal commemorates the 200th anniversary of the Mint. Now, take a close look. Every coin and medal made at the Mint is a beautiful piece of art. In fact, I'm going to take you upstairs and introduce you to some of the people who designed them. We're now in the engraving room. This is the room where all the coins in the Mint are designed. In fact, we're going to be speaking with one of the designers now. This is Jim Farrell. Hi, Jim. How are you? Hi, Deborah. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. What are you doing? Well, I'm working on a design for the World Cup commemorative coin set. Mm -hmm. This is the front side of the dollar coin. Mm -hmm. Now, this isn't a regular coin. This is actually a commemorative coin. That's right. And this was the concept that was selected for this piece. Mm -hmm. Now, I noticed there's not a lot of detail in the original, the face, the muscles. Where did you get all this detail from? Well, I'll redraw this design, and by using reference material and photographs of soccer players, and also close-up shots of uh, my co-workers' ha hands and arms and legs, mm -hmm. I will incorporate all that into this drawing to try to make it look realistic. Mm -hmm question i mean even still i could only draw stick figures and your artwork is wonderful i mean how long have you been doing something like this uh, i've been working at this now for 25 years wow that's a long time but the detail is so wonderful in that how do you get all that detail from this drawing onto a coin well we will take a tracing of this and transfer it to a plaster basin mm -hmm. now i can show you someone working on that now if you want to follow me okay and Deborah, this is John Mercanti. Thanks. Hi, Deborah. Hi, John. How are you? Fine. Sit down. Thanks. So, what are you doing? Deborah, this is the 50 cent piece for the World Cup commemorative program, and I'm interpreting the pencil drawing into a clay model. Mm -hmm. Now, did you draw this yourself? Yes, I did. Now, what are these instruments for? These are various tools that I use in the course of the modeling, and some of them, as you can see, are finer than the others, and of course I'll use the very fine ones to get and do a lot of the detail. So these really help you get the details like in the hair? And oh, absolutely. And how, how fine a detail can you get? Well, we can, we can get very fine detail. As an example, I'm working on the socks here. So if you look very closely as I work on it, you can see that I can get right down in there and pick up all the detail at the top of the sock. Mm -hmm. So it's not just an engraving job. This really is a, a lot of artwork involved. Oh, absolutely. I, I've, always, uh, I've always said to children that they carry an art gallery in their pocket. Definitely. So, what's next? Well, from this stage, we go into a plaster model. And Ed Stever is over there working on a plaster model, and I'm sure he'd be very glad to show you what he's working on. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ed, hi. Oh, nice to see you, Debbie. Well, nice to see you, too. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Now, this I recognize. This is the United States of America quarter. Exactly. Listen, I was just speaking with John, who had made a plaster model, and then he had the clay model over top. So, what's next? Fixing up the details, getting them all in good, sharp condition for continuing the coinage. Mm -hmm. Now, I noticed something I wouldn't normally recognize on a regular quarter. What does this S stand for? This is the S mint mark. It tells in which mint it's made in the United States. This S stands for San Francisco, where the coin will be struck. Mm. I also see some detail down here, tiny detail. They look like initials, J, F. John Flanagan was a sculptor and who made the models in 1932. So this quarter design right here is all the way from the 1930s up until now. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's exactly. really interesting. So what happens next? Now it has to be uh, copied from an original plaster into a rubber negative mm -hmm. so we can make several and that's exactly the same dimensions without shrinkage and then we pour plastic over it and that's nice and strong and then you will have something that's durable it's an epoxy uh, model which will withstand machining now see i'm not used to seeing a coin this big so how would we take this model finally and make it smaller well you take it into the transfer engraving machine uh, room and they will show you 
exactly how it gets reduced. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Bye. Bye-bye. Wow. So this is the transfer room. You know what? Let's talk to Tony and find out what goes on here. Hi, Tony. Hi, Deborah. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Now, this I recognize. This is an epoxy model of the back of the quarter. And we saw the front in the engraving room. But what are you doing to the back of the quarter? What I'm doing here, Deborah, is I'm preparing this model to reduce it to an actual coin size, which happens to be uh, 10 to 1. So this is 10 times the size of the actual quarter that you're going to make. Right. It seems like a lot of math to me. Yes, it is. Now, what are these? They're the actual dies that will strike the coin. Now, when you say strike, you actually mean? Strike, yes. Wow. But still, how are you going to get this model to look exactly like this? Well, let me show you. OK. Well, Deborah, this is our transfer reducing machine. And this particular machine is about 100 years old. Wow. And what we do here with it is we transfer from the model size to the actual coin size. How does the machine do that? It does that by tracing over all the artwork and the cutter cutting it into the steel. It's moving so slowly. It looks like it takes so long. Yeah, it takes approximately three days. It is a long time. OK, so when this gets done, what's next? Well, I think you're headed to the press room. OK. And you'll need these. Goggles and earplugs. What am I going to need goggles and earplugs for, yeah. Tony? You'll find out. Work starts here at the blanking press. This coiled roll of metal is as long as five football fields. It'll be used to make 325,000 nickels. Long ago, most coins had some gold or silver in them. Today, most are made from a blend of nickel and copper. And just like a giant cookie cutter, this press punches out blanks. The blanks end up over here. The rest of the metal is shredded and recycled. And some of it is melted into little bars called pigs. Believe me, there's no metal wasted at the mint. The blanks move on to furnaces where they're heated. washed, and dried. The blanks are still warm as they move on to their next stop, the riddling machine. The shaking Riddler screen sifts out any blanks that are the wrong size or shape. riddled blanks tumble into the upsetting machine. The upsetter raises the edges of the blanks just slightly. The blanks keep on moving. The next stop, the coining presses. And here are the high-speed presses in action. The fastest ones punch out 12 coins a second. It's so fast, you almost can't see what's happening. Now, take a close look at the results. coins are spot checked for quality.
Then, you're counted and bagged. A sack of pennies holds $50, and dimes are packed $1,000 per bag. Once the money is bagged, it's stored until it's needed. Every bag you see here is filled with coins. Coins are the only kind of money that the mint produces. But that's not the only kind of money in your pocket, is it? What about the billions of paper dollars we use? Welcome to the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. The Bureau produces paper money in Washington, D.C. and Fort Worth, Texas. And this year, more than eight billion notes would be printed. And if you could stack them in a single pile, those bills would reach 543 miles straight up. It takes 65 steps to make each bill. And just like coins, it all begins here in the engraving department. Just look at that detail. Those carefully etched lines make life tough on counterfeiters. This work is nearly impossible to copy. The artwork on a single bill is actually the work of many different engravers. All the engravings are combined on this machine called a transfer press. The talented people who operate these machines are siderographers. There are only a few specially trained siderographers in the entire world. A siderographer creates a master plate on the transfer press. From the master, a printing plate is made. Each plate prints 32 bills at one time. The printing plate is mounted on a high-speed press. 8,000 sheets pass through in an hour, enough to make over 250,000 bills. Sheets of currency are run through the presses several times. First, the green backs are printed, and then the fronts. Next, the sheets are cut in half and checked for printing flaws. Rejects, called mutts, are removed and destroyed. The good bills are printed one final time with the Treasury and Federal Reserve seals. At the same time, a unique serial number is assigned to each bill. The finished bills are cut and sorted into 100 note packets and inspected one last time. Finally, they're wrapped in 4,000 note bricks for shipping. Now, they're ready to go. Thanks, Bernadette. Talk to you later. You know, money making at the Bureau of Engraving and Printing and here at this mint, it's a never-ending job. Those presses just keep on rolling to meet the demands for new coins and bills. And who knows? You know, someday, some of the coins from this truck could end up in your pocket. And now you know what it took to make them. goes another truckload of newly minted coins. And right on time, I might add. Oh, time! That reminds me, I've got to go and put another quarter in the parking meter, so I'll see you guys later. I'm proud. How was that? It was great, no oh, problem. Oh, good, thanks. Okay, folks, let's wrap it up. We'll see you on Monday. We're done. Here's some last minute trip changes for next week. Oh, okay. Oh, and this is for you, too. Thanks. Paycheck, all right. Money, 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 money. <laughs> well, you guys didn't think I did this just for fun, did you? Coins and paper money, that's only part of the money story. But a check like this one is money in the bank. Instead of stuffing their money into empty mayonnaise jars or piggy banks, many people save their money in bank accounts. Now, when they need to use their money, they can write a check, 
cash a check or take money out of their bank account electronically with one of these. Banks also pay interest on money that people save, which means extra cash for you and make loans to people who need them. Did you know that all that saving and investing adds to the wealth of our country? I like to fool around with a lot of things, but uh, not my money. I'm depositing my paycheck into my checking account. Most of that will go to pay bills. I'm also saving a little for a rainy day and withdrawing a little cash for the weekend. Thanks, Tom. Whether you have a lot of money or just a little, you need to keep track of it very, very carefully. Hey, how about you? How do you get your money? What do you do with it? I get money by babysitting, helping my grandma. And sometimes I go to the store for people, and they give me money. And every week I get an allowance. I work for my money. Um, I go pick blueberry and strawberry over the summer. I help the um, senior citizens on my block. I go to the store for them, and I help clean around the house for them, and I do chores in my house. Clean the kitchen. Sometimes the litter box. <laughs> well, I actually don't get a big allowance. I just get some money when I need it. And sometimes if I want some money, like if I'm going somewhere, <clears throat> then they'll give me some money. Yesterday we had a flea market, and I sold some of my stuff, and I made $40. I spent 20 of it, and I saved 20 So I try to save up a little and spend some. When the people pay me, I put it in the bank, and I have my little book on whatever I spend but I'm really saving up for a CD player. In my room, there's this box, and sometimes I put my money in there, and then, like, a week later, I see how much money I have and stuff. I collect coins, and I have them in a hat that I specially keep, and I hide it in a special place. I save my money in my piggy bank. <laughs> Not afraid to say that I got a piggy bank. So what? <laughs> <laughs> I spend my money on baseball cards, Nintendo games, and other toys like G.I. Joe's and stuff. And usually clothes, because, I don't know, I just, I like to get new clothes, but sometimes I spend it on candy or something. Just regular kid stuff, I guess. <laughs> when I do get allowance, I usually spend it on maybe jewelry and presents for people. Sometimes, if I have, like, if, if I get in trouble at home, and I have money on me and my mom, and I feel that my mom is probably going to do something, I usually go to the store and buy her some flowers, and they'll calm her down. And sometimes I loan my sister money. If she needs it, she pays me back. So I, I, I do a lot of things with my money. I, I'm not selfish. I don't give it to myself all the time. I don't spend my money on anything. I prefer to save it. When I say mine, I, I want to be a lawyer when I grow up. So that's why I, I start saving for my college, and that's why I put it in a um, bank account. I think that when I grow up, I'm going to have a lot of money. So I think that I should be rolling in the big bucks. <laughs> you and I can keep track of our money without too much trouble. But what about an entire country? Managing that much money must be a colossal challenge. Now, when you watch our nation's money factories in action, managing that much money is easy. Need a little more? Just keep printing. OK, hold it. Stop the presses. Actually, it's not that easy. The total amount of money in our nation's economy has to be carefully controlled. And that's a job for the Fed. The Fed is a nickname for the Federal Reserve System. It consists of 12 regional banks, including this one in San Francisco, California. The Fed is the banker's bank. Local banks that we use keep a certain amount of money deposited there. When that money arrives, it's sorted, counted, and stored. Worn out bills are removed and replaced by brand new ones. The Fed gets new money from the Bureau of Engraving and Printing and the Mint. The Fed's vault is a giant storehouse where money is held until banks need it. But the Fed's job doesn't stop there. They help control the amount of money in society. And here's how they do it. Here are the money factories that produce coins and currency. Over here are the banks plus people like you and me. 
and in the middle is the Fed. The Fed works like a dam in a river of money heading into our economy. When there's too little money flowing, people spend less, and our economy is in danger of drying up. So the Fed increases the amount of money to get the economy moving. Sometimes our society starts to get flooded with too much money. Then the Fed slows the flow. The right amount of money in circulation helps keep our economy rolling along. The Fed has another important job, to destroy old and damaged currency so it can't be used again. A dollar bill is durable, but after 18 months of hand-to-hand -hand combat, many of them are worn out. Old bills are canceled. Then they go on their final journey to the shredder. So, now you know that all money, from pennies to paychecks to dollar bills, is connected. Money ties us all together whenever we find it or earn it, spend it. Pretzel, please. Thanks. Or give it away. So, use the money that you have wisely. Remember, taking care of money makes sense. And cut. How was that? That was great. That's a key. Oh, good. Oh, I'm good. glad. It's a wrap. Right. What are you doing? I, I'm hungry. All, I mean... all the props. Oh, no. All the props. Not my lucky penny, all Rob. Please, I've been the carrying props. them all day long. Look but, at Mr. Lincoln, please. But, yeah, but you see, this is a prop. All props must be accounted for. Thank you. Thank you. Didn't account for this prop, did you, Rob? <laughs>